All right, let's get started after some technical difficulties. Thank you, Lily, for uh, lending us your laptop. Okay, so welcome to the Thanos Deep Dive. Um, before we jump into the presentation, uh, let's show, give a quick show of hands. Who here is already using Thanos? Wow, very cool. Who is planning on using Thanos? Okay, that's pretty much, I think almost everyone raised their hand now. But, and if anyone didn't, then hopefully we can convince you today as well. For everyone who did raise their hand, hopefully we can raise your confidence in this system or make your, um, about running it already, or hopefully we can increase your confidence about um, what you're about to be using. So, um, I'm Frederick, I work at Red Hat. I work on pretty much everything um, around observability at Red Hat. Um, I'm a Prometheus maintainer, I'm a Thanos maintainer, that's kind of why I'm here. Um, and I also lead SIG instrumentation within Kubernetes, and I have Bartek with me today. Yeah, hello, I'm Bartek. I'm also working for the same team as Frederick um, for on shift monitoring, and I'm a Prometheus maintainer and co uh, initial co author uh, of the Thanos project as well. And I'm really passionate about building distributed systems. So, uh, we already had our Thanos introduction, uh, but let's recap a couple of things uh, just so we make sure we uh, are on the same page. So, Thanos is um, obviously part of the CNCF, that's why we're here. Um, it's a CNCF sandbox project, and uh, we have all these wonderful open source repo stats that you can read here, a bunch of stars, and so on. Obviously, the most important metrics out there. Um, and more largely, um, we operate within the Prometheus ecosystem, and I think something that's really important to internalize about Thanos is we, don't, we want to not reinvent the wheel, so we want to make use of everything that is already existing in the Prometheus ecosystem, and um, if it's not good enough, we improve that as opposed to reinventing everything new. Um, yeah, and something that I personally think is super exciting, which is completely non-technological, is we recently um, set up uh, like neutral governance uh, for the project so that all of you can continue in to enjoy um, this project and uh, can trust that no one company will ever take over this project. So I think that's really awesome. Um, but yeah, now let's jump back into technical things. So um, let's re reiterate on a couple of architectural things about Thanos so that we can deep dive um, into some of the cooler things. Um, so this is probably one of the most common setups that you see running Thanos. So what we see here is a set of Prometheus servers that have the Thanos sidecar next to it. And the Thanos sidecar exposes something that we call the store API. And this is kind of the universal language that every component within, um, within Thanos speaks. And so the courier calls out via the store API to these sidecars, and that's how you can get a global view of your data. And this is probably the very first thing that everyone does when they start to use Thanos. And so the very next thing that people then start doing is they don't only have the courier access all of this data, they also configure the sidecar to upload this data that Prometheus periodically flushes to disk to object storage. And then eventually you also not just have this be a backup, but you actually put the Thanos store gateway in front and actually can query all of this long-term data. So whenever we do this, the, when we now insert a, courier, a query into our courier, our nice expression browser, right, that we're, we know and love from Prometheus already. Um, we have that in Thanos as well. So when we do that, the courier won't only fan out to the sidecars to get the live data, you will also get the historic data that is loaded from object storage. So I think this is a, probably a very typical, typical use case that we see um, in the evolution. Some people don't even go to this next step. Um, and what we see here is an additional component called the ruler. And what this allows you to do is to do um, alerting and rule evaluation on a global level. Most of the time, alerting on the leaf Prometheus is just fine, and you should always continue doing that. Uh, but there are things like uh, trend analysis or uh, like cross cluster analysis that you want to do where the ruler comes in handy. So you can also make use of all the rule evaluation things that uh, we're used to on the leaf Prometheuses. And then going even further, as I said, all of these components all 
um, expose the store API, and we don't stop at the courier. The courier also exposes this thing, which I think is really cool because now this allows us to layer the system in a hierarchical manner and build truly global systems. So as I was going through all of these architectures, if you paid attention, and I hope everyone did, I know it's late, but um, what was common in all of these architectures is one really crucial component, and this is the store API. And this is one of the things that I want to deep dive a little bit uh, more into today. So, literally every component either exposes or somehow interacts with this API within Thanos. So, really, the sidecar, the store, the ruler, the, uh, the receive component, if you uh, went to some of the other Thanos talks, there were a couple of mentions about this. This is still an experimental component and you should totally evaluate whether you actually need that component, but this also exposes it and um, the courier itself exposes it. So I think um, this is a really important thing to understand when you run a Thanos cluster and that's why we want to talk about it here. And one thing that we didn't initially plan for the store API to do but because this is such a common thing or it's such a um, standardized way of communicating within the Thanos cluster, this actually allowed for really cool integrations that we had never thought about. So there was uh, a research group, for example, that implemented an adapter for the, that kind of turns the store API calls into calls against OpenTSDB. And suddenly people could query all this data that they had historically always had in their OpenTSDB and query it with the Prometheus query language, for example. That's awesome, we never even thought of that. So I think this is one of those things where having such a common language to talk um, our, about with our data comes in really, really handy. So this is really what the um, gRPC service definition looks like. This is literally what I copied out of our repo um, and removed some comments, obviously, because we have comments, I promise. Um, so one of the things is the info method. And what this is essentially is that the courier, when it knows about these stores, it periodically goes and grabs all of this information and it tells the courier what data a store, a particular store has so that it knows whether to fan out to this store or not. Um, and the series, I think, is kind of obvious. This is the actual raw data where the courier grabs time series from a store um, to process in a query. And then the other two are not quite as obvious, I think, but once you know what it's for, I think it is more obvious, which is label names and label values is whenever you type a, an expression into the expression browser in Thanos or in Prometheus even, this originally is an API that existed or exists in Prometheus, is, and this is for autocomplete. So when you start typing, you get a dropdown in the expression browser that tells you these are all the, the metrics that are available. It does um, autocomplete essentially, and that's this is how it works internally. So let's walk through the entire workflow essentially from the courier to how it gets all of this data. So really like primitive kind of setup could be that you have your Thanos courier and you literally just say, this is the address for my store that I want you to talk to. Um, and this is perfectly fine, a lot of people do this, um, but in more dynamic environments where you maybe have Prometheus servers appearing and disappearing, sounds kind of familiar, we're at KubeCon, I guess. Um, you may want, to use a, may want to make use of one of our discovery mechanisms like DNS discovery. Um, and so this could automatically make sure that um, stores that appear uh, are automatically added to, um, to the courier. And then, as I said, the courier periodically goes out to these stores and calls the info endpoint, and this is exactly the response that we previously sa saw in the gRPC service definition, and this is literally what it returns. The time range that this particular store can serve, um, the, what kind of store it is, as well as a particular set of labels that identify all the data in that, uh, in that store. And why this is important is because now we can make true negative matches of our queries. So let's see how that works and what that means. So whenever we do a query, this is a very typical query, for example, um, that you see in Prometheus world, everything in this query gives us hints as to how we can optimize this query in, um, in Thanos. So for example, we have the metric name and we have some label selectors on this, in this query. And so this label selector can tell us um, because some of our stores 
are exposing this label, this, this particular label name, so we can make sure we know because of our query we are selecting region US, what did I do? US East 1. We know only truly one of our stores is ever going to be able to serve data like this. And so we know that we don't even have to request all these other ones. And there are a bunch of other um, optimizations that we could do that we haven't done yet that are really typical in a, system, in a distributed system like this. Cassandra, for example, um, does a, really, a couple of really cool things with bloom filters um, where we can also do true negative matches so we know that we never need to fan out to a particular set of nodes. Um, so those are things that we want to explore that we haven't really. There are still a bunch of experiments that we're running in order to figure out is fanning out to a store actually that expensive with, a, with an empty result? So those are some of the questions that we're, that we're still exploring. But um, just we thought in a deep dive it's kind of cool to share like the thoughts that we're going through as we're um, working and optimizing the system. So. I talked about this, all of this in the sense of the querier, but this is actually an abstraction that we have in Thanos that we call the proxy store. And why I bring this up is because this is not, this is not just the querier. This is a concept that we can now reuse. And as a matter of fact, I won't dive, dive into where we reuse this um, in Thanos because actually it ha hasn't been implemented, but it's being discussed. Um, but I think it's just really cool that we have these abstractions that we can talk about um, in the Thanos project now and we can think about on a more abstract level. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to share about the store API. And now Bartek will tell us a little bit of um, how we actually are able to serve long-term storage of data. Thank you, Frederick. Um, before we start, I would like to ask two questions. Um, can you please raise a hand if you are now um, storing and have access to years metric, uh, years worth of metrics in your monitoring system. Anyone have access to years of the, years of the data? Okay, okay, so it's pretty rare, right? It's because it's a hard problem to solve. And now please raise a hand if you'd like to have an access for the years of the data, if you'd like to have this feature. Okay, it's like half of the, of the room. Uh, and, and actually it's, 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 uh, it makes sense because it's, it's super useful to have a very long, uh, time uh, metric retention for your metrics. Now, this is you know, crucial because you, you would like to have you know, um, um, data, the access to the, to, the, um, to the data in the past. And you could have you know, uh, perform long-term characteristic detection or like, uh, maybe you want to report your um, service level indicators and you want to check something in the past. Um, maybe you know you missed some 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 detail during uh, incident response or something like that. So having this data available um, in your storage is the key. And as we learned uh, yesterday from uh, Lucas and Dominique on the Thanos intro and from Frederick uh, just a minute ago, um, Thanos is designed to have virtually to to be able to store and query um, a virtually unlimited retention of your metrics. Now, in this part, I would like to focus and spend time to, to, div in, to dive into challenges that you might have while querying years of the data in actually any Prometheus-based system. So the system that will use, you know, use PromQL um, as, a, as a query layer. Um, and all starts with a dynamic query, uh, query re resolution, right? When you think about uh, graphing the metrics on your monitor, graph, uh, for example, in Grafana dashboard or Prometheus or Thanos UI, um, having dynamic query uh, resolution is very important. This is because you know the data and the storage they are probably scraped with uh, high resolution, like relatively high resolution, like 15 seconds um, something, for example. Rendering all of those um, samples during query means uh, you know longer time ranges, like one month, suddenly needs to uh, display you know 200,000 of samples, and that's way beyond you know number of pixels we have in our monitors. Even if someone has like a you know 4K wide screen, uh, match screen. Um, so, well, how PromQL engine solves that problem, that uh, limitation, right? Um, and PromQL engine is something that many, many projects reuse right now, like Thanos, Prometheus, Cortex even, right? So this applies to all of them. For each query range um, request, PromQL defines certain step. And 
PermQL then evaluates the given query, every defined step independent of the sample stored um, um, in your storage. So we can efficiently present you know, larger time range with result being you know, ac uh, accurate enough. So how it looks in practice. In this example, we have one five uh, hour time range query, uh, which we render, uh, where we render like 250 samples uh, per series on the screen. But we actually work on 1,000 series you know, um, on the storage level. And while this works and you can have dynamic query um, resolution, there are some limit to it. Um, notably, like, you know, maybe when we extend the time range to the month of the uh, month time range, suddenly we, uh, um, we are still displaying the same resolution thanks to the dynamic step. However, we are touching and working on, on, on the large number of samples that in, uh, in case of like Thanos system, we have to somehow fetch and download from the object storage. Now, downloading is not the only cost we have right now because uh, for that, um, uh, as you might probably be familiar, we are storing samples in a compressed um, chunks, uh, which is like essentially a gorilla compression algorithm um, um, structures where we store uh, all our samples in. Um, this reduces like the size of the overall storage like 11 times in average um, and allows us to save disks, um, IO, and network bandwidth in terms of Thanos, in case of Thanos. But there is trade-off, right? And one of the trade-offs is that the compressing takes time. And for one sample, it can be you know, up to 40 nanoseconds. So this means like, that it's actually fair latency for smaller time range uh, requests. Um, Times uh, shorter time range queries. However, you know, in, when we increase that, um, when we start to query like months of the data, it's actually pretty significant uh, amount of the time. So, you know, um, within uh, if we increase that even to year, it gets too extreme because we suddenly have to fetch and present like two, over two million billions, um, two billions of samples, which already takes you know over one minute. Um, of the time, of the latency, just to decompress those samples. Uh, not mentioning index lookup and other latencies as well. So what do we know about, like what you know at this point? Uh, first of all, even compressed data uh, for one year is, is, uh, is quite heavy on the disk. Um, secondly, it takes long time to decode all those samples on the fly during query time. And furthermore, with dynamic query resolution, thanks to this step, we don't really fully utilize all those samples, right? So how we can improve this situation? Now, this is where Thanos downsampling comes uh, very, very handy. And this is why Thanos kind of designed downsampling from the very beginning of the project. Um, and downsampling is this idea of re reducing resolution, um, or re reducing the resolution of the picture of may maybe metric data while preserving the majority of the accuracy of the result. Now, how we achieve that inside Thanos? So as you may be very familiar, Thanos uh, reuse the, the same TSDB format as Prometheus does. So everything is stored in the TSDB blocks. Now, Thanos has this compactor component which uh, compacts those blocks, but also on top of it, it uh, runs down sampling process which transforms those you know, raw blocks into uh, blocks with five minute resolution and then uh, this five minute resolution is, com is downsampled into one hour. Um, this allows to overall reduce massively the chunk size um, thanks to the lower resolutions. But uh, let's look on how we do this while still preserving, uh, preserving accuracy, right? Because that's important. We don't want to lose any information. For each row chunk, we have to com compute various aggregations, right? So technically, for, each for one chunk, we have five smaller aggregation chunks. So we have count, which you know, have um, number of samples for the current window. We have sum, which, which aggregates the sum of the uh, values in the current window. We have minimum, maximum. We have, uh, at the end, uh, we have also a counter, which maintains the state of the counter and uh, makes sure we are accounting for the counter resets, obviously, as well. And this is important because this will be used uh, against uh, queries that requires fa uh, rate functions or rate-based functions like rate increase, I-rate. Now, uh, we also can combine two of those aggregation chunks into 
um, together to calculate, for <coughs> example, average. Um, so that's pretty handy as well. So how it works in practice, right? We, we know how it looks on the, on the storage level, how essentially uh, PromQL knows what chunk to use and uh, if you sell something, uh, don't sample to resolution uh, at all, right? So let's take this uh, example from QL um, query where we have like write, a rate over a counter of the others uh, for step uh, 10 seconds, which is very, very high resolution. Um, what is happening is that PromQL asks the storage, which is Thanos in this case, for example, and it gives very uh, a lot of you know details uh, in the in the request. We have you know label um, matchers, you have time range requested, you have a step, and a, a hint uh, for for the functions that will be used over this data. So because this is high resolution, the, the requested data uh, is is uh, re requested to be in high resolution. We as a Thanos, we, uh, we uh, respond with the raw chunks. Now, let's imagine that we are actually extending time range to maybe a you know, um, month of the data. Suddenly, the step is automatically um, calculated to be, let's say, half an hour. And, and then um, Thanos has to decide what resolution to choose on the storage level. And it does it by asking, can I fit at least five samples within this, uh, within this um, uh, interval? And the answer is for half an hour, yes, we can use five minute resolution because there, uh, there will be potentially six samples within that uh, window. Um, so we have th this is how the Thanos decides how to, like, what resolution to use. However, as you remember, we have like five um, those aggregation chunks. So um, this is where the hints uh, comes handy from the, from the PromQL request where uh, it, it gives us, it advises what function will be used, in this case, rate, so we know what uh, aggregation should be used on the storage level and present it to the, uh, to the PromQL for evaluation. Now, when we change, for example, query to the average of certain gouge uh, for active alerts, for example, then, uh, you know, hint changes as well to average, and this is how we know um, what um, aggregation chunks to use. Uh, for example, sum and count in this case. Now, okay, at this point we know how Thanos down samples the data, how it chooses what uh, chunks to use over um, on the query time, but let's look on the result, like what, what we fix, uh, what we fixed, what we solved. So this is, uh, you know, um, if instead of the high resolution um, data, we use the sample data for the month or one year queries, we suddenly can achieve much, much more kind of user-friendly experience, right? And 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 lower load on on the um, Thanos system. And performing those long-term, uh, long time range queries are much, much no, uh, much more uh, cheaper and faster, which was our initial goal. Now there are like few um, things that you need to be careful when using downsampling. And this is why downsampling was, was previously um, released as an experimental feature. Um, first of all, you, some UIs are choosing the step in a different way. For example, Prometheus UI and Thanos UI are having semantics of specifying you know, interval in seconds. However, when you use Grafana, there is this thing called resolution, which is essentially a ratio of samples per pixel. Secondly, using rate with downsampled data might be tricky. So, People used to have uh, just raw data and, and used to hard code this five minute range selection. And there is a very important thing about it because uh, to, for rate to, to work correctly, you need to have at least two samples within this range selector. And now when you query um, the data that it's, uh, you have lower resolution, so for example, for uh, five minutes, you might have you know, one sample, it's, uh, it's in this case, you need to kind of increase this range, select, range selector to the larger values for this function to kind of make sense. That's why you should use, you know, maybe one hour and maybe four, five hours for uh, the, the queries that will be using, you know, one uh, hour resolution. However, in Grafana, there is something like internal variable, which is very handy as well because it automatically calculates you um, what uh, is a sensible range selector that should be used for a given time range. And last but not the least, you need to be caref careful if you, you know, set your retention to just uh, remove all your raw, uh, or like most of your raw um, data and just store, you know, downsampled um, resolution, uh, downsampled blocks. 
it's really easy to forget that you, it will work if you query you know, one month, one year, couple, I don't know, couple of weeks. However, if you want to zoom in to certain situation, suddenly you won't see any samples. So this is uh, something you need to have in mind. In an ideal world, you, uh, you, would, like, you would have you know, all, those, all the resolutions um, available in your system, which allows flexibility because you can query long time ranges, as well as zoom in into you know, what happened one year ago. Now, there is a trade-off, obviously, and the trade-off here is the, that it increases the size of the stored data in the object storage. However, uh, we choose in you know, object storage because it's cheap, so this is, might, might be worth to, uh, to consider. It's also worth to mention that the, that the Prometheus ecosystem is looking for some downsampling solution, right? And, um, and well, they try to um, explore if, if it's useful, and if yes, like what implementation should be, uh, should be, should be done, should be chosen. And uh, as a Thanos, like we, uh, we chosen some implementation, uh, and, and we are already discussing and collaborating with other systems to make this something a standard, right? Maybe to have this in the Prometheus itself. Um, so we are looking forward to you know, collaborate even more with, uh, with projects like Cortex or M3BDB um, where we can have a common downsampling logic that we can all reuse and improve on. Now, that was for downsampling, right? But like, on a related note to the unlimited retention, like, obviously uh, um, there are some consequences on like, you need to scale the uh, long-term storage read path as well, right? So this is something uh, we were um, um, improving uh, over the last month by enabling a like, couple of new mechanisms for um, scaling the store gateway, essentially. And the store gateway is this component that is um, deployed on the objects uh, against the object storage and allows you to browse, in, uh, browse those old metrics. And uh, Overall, it works great. However, with large, huge number of objects in the object search, you, uh, you can expect some um, kind of um, mm, slowdown. So you, so you need to be able to have like a scale out path for, for this case. And one of the mechanism here is uh, time partitioning. So in the current version of the, of the newest the version of the Thanos, um, we allow to you know, kind of tell the store gateway to be responsible only for a subset of the blocks for a certain time range. So with this configuration, um, if, the querier, uh, will, uh, I mean, if the query will touch a certain time range, it will go, for example, one year uh, or, or like half a year ago or before, it will go to the upper store gateway. If, if it will be for a fresh data, it will go to the, another one. Second mechanism to, to scale out uh, store gateway to different nodes is uh, block sharding. Block sharding is, is, um, is a, again, a way to tell um, um, store gateway to be responsible only for a certain blocks. For example, for blocks from a certain region, like in this example. Um, thanks to that, uh, and actually you do that uh, via kind of relabeling configuration that is exactly the same as relabeling during uh, scrape. Um, uh, scraping the data on, on Prometheus side or service discovery. And, um, and you essentially tell what blocks to choose based on external label as well. So thanks of that, when you have a query against, you know, maybe certain that's selecting, that is selecting certain region, you, uh, you know where to, like what store gateway to touch and you, you only direct this uh, query to the uh, correspondent store gateway, which again allows us to um, scale out um, store gateway in some way. Now, um, yeah, overall, let's sum up what we learned today. Um, we explain our store API and you know, what role it has in our system and why it gives flexibility in a way. We dive into downsampling and, and why it's important and what we actually are solving here. And last but not least, we touch some uh, ways to further scale out the read path on the tunnel's long-term storage. So with this being said, uh, we are thank you, uh, thanking you for, for uh, listening to us. And yeah, we are happy to take some questions. And we might have four minutes for that, yeah. Any questions? OK, you can ask the first question, and then you're my partner. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good.
Uh, so I had a question about the read hints. So I assume you're picking apart the PromQL and you see certain functions and you like identify like a read hint. Uh, does that mean you have to have a read hint hard coded in Thanos somewhere for every PromQL function in order to handle it efficiently? Yeah, so uh, you say so, but there is only uh, like a six of those, to be honest. So, you know, we care about minimum, maximum. Yes, we need to match to the aggregations. We care about rate based functions and uh, count and sum. So there is like not many of those. And kind of fortunately, because uh, PromQL is very stable in terms of functions, this works well. But yes, uh, overall, that's the idea. Thank you. Question over there. Thanks for a great talk. Uh, I had a question about sort of how to layer. Like, would you recommend like what's a reasonable number of sort of Prometheus instances to have sort of one Thanos behind, and when do you want to sort of add another sort of query on top of it? So, like, do you just do it on a DC, and sort of you'll have every service in there, or do you say like, oh well, 500 services per query, basically? So, good. Yeah. So the good and bad answer here is. Um, Thanos is almost a toolkit, right? So there's no one size fits all. So that's uh, part of the sad answer because there, there is no one size fits all, but it also means that you can optimize exactly for your use case. So yeah, there's no, there's no real answer to this, but um, most people, the, the way that we see it um, is that people start layering, um, or people start with the sidecar, they use the sidecar as the upload mechanism, and it's really just a backup, right? They add the querier, you get horizontal, um, like global view of your data. Then you do um, long-term storage, and then maybe you have another courier that um, spans across all your clusters. Um, so that's a totally typical um, kind of architecture, and like I highly recommend everyone doing that at first. Um, when to add a new Prometheus, for example, is more, less of a question um, of a, of, for Thanos, more um, how large of a machine are you willing to pay for for that Prometheus is more, um, more the question here because um, at the end of the day, you always will need to ingest all of that data, right? And if you chart it across multiple Prometheus instances or have it in one, it doesn't really matter um, unless you want to really pack it, bin pack it into small machines, right? That, that's totally a legit thing to do, but that doesn't nominally have anything to do with Thanos, it's just scaling your Prometheus servers. Does that sort of answer the question? Yeah, it was also the, the, the layering of Thanos where you had like multiple queries, like you'll have one per DC and then you'll have one global one, sort of, so you have two layers of Thanos, but would it be sort of, should you have within the DC maybe two query, query instances sort of that takes care of different services. Yeah, that makes sense. So, uh, yeah, you're essentially asking if, uh, like, when to use federated queries and, and stuff like that. Like, essentially, um, there is no recommendation from the, like, Thanos side. Like, all, in terms of efficiency, there is not much of the difference. However, it's just, uh, you know, the user experience difference. Maybe you want to expose, you know, um, be able to just allow users to query for just one cluster site or, um, or like something that is a, that is a very popular. You have like different environments, right? Production, testing, and, and staging, and you have um, you know Thanos on those three environments because you want to isolate the data. And I really, really, really recommend that. And then you have a federated layer on top of this because maybe an administrator want to or like any other use case uh, where you would like to have uh, aggregation over different environments for cost, for example, calculation or something like that. So it's really. Um, yeah, your requirements should shape uh, kind of Thanos, and there is no like efficiency uh, yeah, difference here in layering, at least, right? Yes. Yes, we will up upload the slides. Uh, there's a question over here. Uh, you showed some of the like performance benefits of downsampling. Yeah. Um, does it? Is there any? difference in uh, like the storage size, like, you know, raw data over a month versus just having like our Yeah, lots. so, or, I mean, yeah, so I think this is like um, a very important like thing to remember, like downsampling is meant to improve your query time, mm -hmm. right? So 
it's not compressing your, your data that much. Like essentially, um, yes, technically the row block and you know, the five minute resolution will probably, five minute resolution will be a bit smaller. However, it's not you know, uh, focused on being like compressed on the disk. Like yeah. we were optimizing for the query latency uh, for the long time ranges. Um, so yeah, that's why you should not, um, you know, if you, if you just want to choose one resolution to store, maybe even the role resolution makes sense more. Uh, because people tend to just use, you know, um, users tend to use, you know, just use downsampling and just remove everything else. Just, okay, have one year downsample data for a long time. Um, Yes, but then you cannot zoom in. However, you could just switch this and, and essentially have a, maybe use exactly the same space, but just use roadblocks, and maybe this will fit your uh, use case more. So gotcha. it depends on our needs, yeah. Exactly, yeah. cool, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think so something important to remember here is that like enabling downsampling actually increases the size of, yeah. of the data that you store, but it in, uh, like reduces the latency of your queries. Um, and if you don't care about the high resolution data, then you can have a, a low resolution on that and keep the, the lower resolution data for longer. But that, as Bartek said, means that you can zoom in and get the high resolution data. So again, like choose what suits your needs. Yes, over here. Just a question with downsampling and, and querying downsample data or making queries that include downsample data and very recent data that might be sitting in a journal, does the journal inhibit the performance of, of the long queries or do you include the journal information in, in the, in the downsampled output or do you exclude it so you don't journal see Journal information? Would yeah, I don't know much about the architecture, but you've, if you've got journaling in the top right of time series database. You're kind of talking like the right ahead log? Of, yeah, the um, right ahead log, exactly. Yes, so, so you know, we are talking about one year of the, of the time ranges, month of the time ranges, where wall is like two hours, so it's not a significant, you know, kind of, uh, so, you know, when you query one year and maybe yes, uh, two days or like, you know, even, even a week is not done sampled yet, and that's true for the fresh data, this is still uh, okay. Like we are talking about, you know, lower resolution for majority of your request, uh, of your time range, right, they were requesting on. But that's a good point, yes. Yeah, right, right. Okay, so you just admit it. Yeah, that's a good answer. <laughs> okay, I think we are out of time, unless there is like last quick question. Uh, this is regarding downsampling again. So the thing is like, uh, you guys are showing a certain standard aggregations, right? Like count, sum, min, max. Uh, how would it actually work for percentiles? Like let's say certain metrics, I, I don't care about average. I only care about like percentiles. Uh, how would I actually downsample? Like, or is there any plans for even adding support for percentile aggregation for downsampling data? So. Um, percentile, or I, I assume you mean hi like histogram, histogram quantile or something like that, right? So um, we would do the calculation for that based on downsample data. As Batik showed, like we, we retain the counter. Hist remember, a histogram is just yeah. a, a, a composition of multiple counters. And so we downsample those counters, and then we can still do the histogram quantile aggregation on that downsampled data. It's just a lot less data that we have to process at this point because it's downsampled. Okay, thanks. Cool. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.